Uh, but really, I'm also going to talk about the economic value of APIs, the economics <clears throat> side of APIs, and what that means towards building an API strategy. And, and you'll come across terms like uh, API products, API strategy, uh, value APIs, and marketplaces. Right? So, so my goal here is to basically see how to bridge that and how to bring the economic side of things into that to, to bring some theory into that so that you can figure out how to basically make successful strategies and successful marketplaces. Uh, I'm based out of the US, East Coast, uh, New Jersey. Uh, it's early morning, late night for me, as you can see outside, right? And uh, yeah, so last time when I was doing this session, I said the kids will be running around at this time, hopefully not. Okay, let me get started. So again, if, if we were, uh, doing this live, I would ask what this is and what you think about this. Of course, this is the Rubik's Cube. Uh, this is the fast cube version of the Rubik's Cube. It's a faster version. Uh, the, the record is, I think, like eight seconds or something. Uh, there's even faster records of doing this. And, and it's much more easier to use than a standard Rubik's Cube. Uh, my son is a big fan of this. Uh, but the reason why I'm talking about this here is that Rubik's Cube is listed as one of the top 10 uh, best-selling toys of all time and and of and it comes in like the top 20 best-selling products of all time and it still stands the test of time right uh, again what are the values of a product right and we we saw a bit of this yesterday we heard a, heard a bit about this yesterday right so so good products basically uh, ha they have a demand right so there's a demand and someone creates the product there's a supply for that product and that caters to that specific demand. So the price of the product is basically based on the value. And there are different theories around how you price a product, right? So if a product has a specific intrinsic value, then you price it based on that. There is another economic theory which says that a product, product's value is based on the labor that goes into it, the, the costs that go into creating that product. Right? So you then price it, uh, base it on that product. There's another theory that says that the value of a product or the price of the product is what someone is willing to pay for it. So if someone is willing to pay $100 for a Rubik's Cube, then that's the price or that's the value of a product. Right? But the bottom line is these are various products. Products are built for customers, for a customer demand, for a user base to satisfy a specific need. And there are the standard economic principles behind creating products. And of course, over time, <clears throat> there have been really great products, right? So uh, this is just, again, a Google search of the best-selling products of all time. Uh, as you can see, there's a number of well-known products, right? <clears throat> Toyota Corolla is there. Uh, that was my first car. Uh, I'm a Star Wars fan. So, so Star Wars is definitely, definitely up there. Uh, Super Mario is, is up there. That, that really shot Nintendo to fame as well. And Michael Jackson's Thriller is also in that list, right? So again, there are different types of lists. I'm just using one type of list here. And, and if you look at all these, all of these products or services, or however you want to call them, cater to a specific requirement, to a specific market, a specific audience, and it has a specific value, right? So this is like product thinking and product design and design thinking at its best. But at the same time, the, you, have the, you have the other side of things, the, the flops, the blunders in products as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples from, from one of my favorite movies, Back to the Future. Uh, so the DeLorean, I, I think it came out in 1982. Uh, and, and it was way ahead of its time, right? And, and the product itself was a flop. Uh, sales crashed and, and uh, this, this model really didn't do well. If you, if you look at the models today, the Tesla has these doors that open upwards, right? And the DeLorean had this back in 1982, and, and that didn't really work out. In 85, Back to the Future came out, and the car was featured in Back to the Future. Of course, the, the, then that shot the DeLorean, DeLorean to fame. Uh, this was, of course, the time machine that Marty McFly and, and Doc Marty used in all three movies and kept being modified in all three movies and, and that, that was really great and sales did shoot up after that the interest did shoot up after that but then because this came out in 1982 and that was too late right so i think in 1986 they filed for bankruptcy uh, so really great product but maybe ahead of its time 
Uh, another example, I just, again, there's, there's many examples, right? But I just picked this Cheetos example. So Cheetos, as you know, it's the, it's the chips brand. And they came up with the Cheetos flavored lip balm. I, I wonder why, right? Uh, so maybe that was someone's market research idea of, of a product that is required, a product that will sell. Uh, that's, that's one of the biggest product blunders of all time. But I wouldn't want to go around wearing like a Cheetos lip balm. Right, even if it's if it's going if it means saving my life, okay. So so those are product blunders, and as what we are looking at is there are both sides. There is the side where you have really good products, good design thinking, and then you have the side where you have products that are not successful. And and that's the same case when it comes to APIs as well. So we do know, and we've been looking at this yesterday as well, that APIs are the products of the 21st century. And, and, and that's the whole concept of this summit. And we're trying to drive that point home. And even in this session, we'll be looking at how that really works. And we looked at how API delivers digital value. Right? So if you have a, some kind of a digital value that's delivered by APIs, and these APIs as a product can then be monetized. And this monetization can be direct monetization. So if you're selling your APIs externally, or if you're exposing it to partners and partners pay some revenue, you have a direct monetization means, or you have an indirect monetization uh, mechanism, right? So let's say you expose an API and you build an application around those APIs, like you build a mobile application and a web application, and you sell the mobile application to customers, or you charge customers for that. So you are indirectly monetizing your API there because that's basically delivering your value. That's encapsulating your value. Right? APIs are increasingly intermediated, traded, marketed. Right? So you're you are communicating with your partners. You, this is being used by your various organizations. This is being consumed by various consumers, et cetera. Not just between organizations, or, but within your organization as well. So different business units can have their own APIs which can be consumed by other business units, so on and so forth. Right? But bottom line, APIs are the products of the 21st century. So what that means is that you need to apply product thinking into API development if you really want to have a successful API story. Right? And there are examples of many examples of really successful API stories. And, and there are different ways of looking at this as well. Uh, there are some APIs that are exposed externally on external marketplaces. There are some APIs that are internal marketplaces or internal developer portals. So you don't have to really expose them externally. Uh, there might be an external application that might be consuming an internal API, right? So th there are different types of marketplaces. There are monetization channels which are direct in some cases and some in some cases indirect monetization channels, right? Uh, so if you take one example, uh, so Proximus uh, is one of the largest telcos, if not the largest telco in, in Belgium, uh, and huge presence in Europe. Uh, so Proximus has a, has a fully fledged, fledged API strategy, and, and they have a strategy where you have two versions. You have a, uh, you have an, a beta set of APIs that are exposed. Uh, so that's part of the Proximus enabling company platform where the team basically keeps on building innovative APIs, newer types of APIs, and exposes those APIs via public marketplace to different beta users. And, and then you track the different users who are using the APIs. And, and users can come and build innovative applications around those APIs. And if there are successful APIs from that, and I'm guessing there'll be like 10 to 20% successful APIs, and you can then take those APIs and start migrating them into Proximus as standard and stable API management platform, which is the platform that serves the major part of the business. So they have that bimodal IT strategy, which is very similar to what places like Google also do. Right? So you, you focus on innovation and you focus on stability. The innovation APIs are exposed externally. They are exposed independently. Once you come to a certain stage, let's say once you come to a critical mass of users using it, and once you figure out that it's successful, then you take that API, you build a business case around it, you pitch it to your architecture team and your business teams within the organization, you get buy-in and you get a product owner and sponsorship for that, and then you start moving it over to your standard API management side. And that has proven very successful to, for Proximus, and that's a good model that we are starting to see in many organizations as well. 
and of course as this is a U- uk summit and and a european summit uh, we should definitely talk about uh, the london network and transport for london uh, this is a link that i just picked up of programmable web uh, from the 13 notable transportation apis which look which list ways and and google apis and so on and so forth and of course tfl is listed there and tfl is one of wso2's customers as well i'm a big fan of the london network right having used the us uh, the new york metro for a long time uh, and and it doesn't compare to the london network right i'm, I'm amazed how the oyster card works and how how smart the card is as well and how these APIs are available, like you can get APIs for, for the bus network, for the taxi network, for the boat network, for the bike network, so on and so forth. And the number of apps that are being built around those APIs as well. So there's a lot of innovations, a lot of hackathon modes going around uh, the TFL APIs to basically innovate on, on top of this. And, and that's a key aspect of building a smart city as well. Right? So the first step in building a smart city is to be able to find the data that you have, start exposing that data in a public format, and then crowdsource that information so that you are crowdsourcing the innovation effort, right? You're trying to get the general public and the businesses and the startups and the innovators to basically build innovative applications. And this is not the day and age where one company tries to tackle the whole world themselves, right? This is a day an age of platforms where you expose your services and then you expect the competition, the, the, the partners, the businesses to basically help you innovate and help you go to market. Right? So very good example in, right here in London as well. So again, so we spoke about products and we spoke about products that have failed. And that, of course, means and if we speak about APIs, then we need to speak about APIs that have failed as well because APIs are, at the end of the day, the digital products of the 21st century. Uh, This screen just shows the security failure side of things. And there have been many examples, and these examples keep growing as well. Uh, That's why API security is a key component. Your platform has to support API security inherently. Your platform should be able to expand that security use case. Like, for example, if you need to bring in like newer types of grant types, or if you need to integrate into your existing single sign-on environment, or if you need to ex- uh, allow your enterprise customer to bring their own identity, BYOID. Right? All of these should be supported by the platform, and, and this, is, this shouldn't be second nature. Right? This should be part and parcel of the platform and, and a core part of your initial API design. Uh, and, and some of these screens talk about the Venmo uh, case, the, the T-Mobile bug, uh, there's some payload uh, credit card information that were exposed, et cetera, as well, right? And there are many examples out there. So security is just one part of uh, failed API projects, right? There are many API projects that don't see the light of day and, and that don't come out into public, which are really failed timelines, right? So there can be different reasons. Someone would start on a project uh, because someone from the top told them that APIs are the next big thing. We want APIs, right? So a push from the top comes through. You then just try to figure out what can be exposed as APIs. You expose whatever you have as APIs, put a lot of effort into it and time into it, and then figure out that there are no real use cases around it or no real users around it. Uh, There's a second case where one single team basically decides that you need an API platform. You expose the platform. And then you figure out that the consumers have decided that it's easier to go around the platform, around the gateway, instead of going through the gateway. So so there are different reasons. But that's why it's important to basically get buy-in early on, have the right advocacy models, have the right documentation, have the right business models, et cetera, so that you create a sustainable platform, not just an API platform, but a platform that is sustainable, a platform that is usable. So that brings me to the second part of this session, where we talk about the different types of value. So the concept that I'm trying to push across here is that APIs and the platforms that expose APIs need to expose value. It's no longer good if you just expose APIs for the sake of exposing APIs. And and this categorization is is mine. Uh, and, And this is basically the way I see it 
is that you have three ways of categorizing value for APIs and the services right, that you expose as APIs. So one is, of course, the individual value. So that we, we call them value APIs or the API value. The second is, of course, the ch chain that we are talking about, the supply chain, and that's the value chain concept. And I'll, I'll tie that into the supply chain discussion we had yesterday. And then the third is the network side of things, the platform business side of things and the value networks. Right? And as part of this categorization, I'll talk about a few economic principles that I've come to learn over the past uh, 15 years of WSO2's operation. We work with like 1,000 plus integration and API management projects. And, and this is really a summary of, of what we've seen. Right? So the first one, of course, is, is basically APIs that provide value. Right? If you take a single API, or if you take a bunch of APIs, that API needs to provide some kind of value. Right? It's not just a matter of taking a service and saying, okay, I'm going to proxy this service, and this is my service exposed as an API. Right? That's when you start getting into the discussion of what's a service, what's an API, what's a managed API. Right? But if you, if you clearly differentiate on the value, that makes it uh, a bit easier. So this is principle number one. Again, my principles solely. So focus on the value programming interfaces or VPIs. Uh, when I've been talking to prospects and customers, uh, for some customers, uh, this, this makes a lot of sense where you talk about an API as a value programming interface. So what you're really doing is taking the value, the digital value of your organization and exposing that. Right? So you start thinking in terms of the value that you can provide to the layers above. Right? So, so if there is a mobile application, What's the value you can provide to that mobile application? Right? So if you have a service in the back end and, and that service exposes, let's say, customer data, right? So that's that's a direct data set that you can access. Now, if you can take that customer data and you monetize that and rate limit that, and now expose it to four different mobile applications, then you are compounding that value, right? You're taking a single value object and then you're allowing like four different people to use that. And if like 10 different people use each mobile application, so that you can then work the math out, right? So there's a network effect of that API being used by 40 different users, and that will continue to grow, right? So there's a network effect there. So, so focus on value. Um, this is an interesting article from a couple of years back from Christian Posta, uh, who spoke about API gateways and, and the fact that gateways are going through an identity crisis, right? So in today's day and age where you have microservices, if you look at it really, gateways are an ubiquitous concept, right? No one should really care about what the gateway is or where the gateway is placed or how many gateway hops there are, so on and so forth, because the APIs can be exposed in your service mesh layer, they can be exposed in Envoy, they can be exposed in different types of gateway layers, they can be exposed multi-cloud and in a cloud native or a gateway layer that's native to the cloud, right? So at the end of the day, your expectation is APIs should be able to APIs should be exposed from any kind of layer, but then there should be a single place where you can register those APIs and discover those APIs and a seamless way of consuming those APIs, regardless of which platform they are sitting in. So this is this is uh, relevant to the gateway technology as well as the APIs itself, and I'm talking about the layer above, which is the APIs itself. <clears throat> And when you talk about value, this is an interesting diagram from a visual capitalist that I use quite often, uh, which basically looks at the different reasons for organizations using APIs. And, and it's an interesting stack, right? If you, if you look at the left-hand side of your screen, you, you see most organizations using APIs to create some kind of B2B channel, right? So a B2B channel or a B2C channels so where you develop new partnerships uh, or you increase revenue or create new business models, right? So you create newer channels uh, where a channel didn't exist before. Uh, there are organizations that also create APIs for regulatory purposes. Right? And this is big in UK, Europe, and Asia Pacific now as well, uh, where you basically see the PSD2, the open banking regulations, right? And there's a couple of uh, discussions and, and sessions following this on, on open banking as well. And that, that's a big driver, right? So regulation is a huge driver 
for digital transformation. And we can see that happening in the financial institutions in the UK and Europe today. Uh, and, and even if you look at COVID, right? So there's a recent stat which says that COVID is one of the largest drivers of digital transformation today in, in many, especially legacy organizations who are not ready for it, right? So it, the incentives comes in different forms, but the, these drive digital transformation. And so, so interesting statistic, and, and there are different reasons why organizations basically look at exposing API, right? And, and uh, as you can see, you can broadly categorize this into newer business models or uh, wrapping up existing, uh, basically, assets. So, so what we looked at the value side of APIs. That's an individual API. Uh, you need to focus on the value of the API and, and look at it from a value perspective instead of just looking at it as an independent technology API. Right? Uh, the second principle that I've come to realize is that APIs are the encapsulation of your intellectual property. And we'll go into an example and then break this down. Right? So one of the examples I'm picking, uh, one of my favorite examples is, is the, one of our use cases, right? Uh, we, we basically deployed WSO2 at Dialog Asiata. So this is Sri Lanka's largest telco. Uh, and it's part of the Asiata group of Malaysia. Uh, and the Asiata group has seven telcos uh, and, and they're one of the leaders in the region. And they have organizations in Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, India, Sri Lanka, so on and so forth. So this is a group deployment. Um, the deployment started in Dialog, and, and this was created as an API marketplace. Right? So it started off as a project where Dialog looked at its internal ecosystem. And there were like a large number of services and large number of APIs. There was around 500 APIs when they started exposing this as a marketplace or as a developer portal for the internal telco ecosystem and this was a time when telcos were just starting to digitally transform right uh, this was the time when skype started really competing twilio came up came up as an over the air provider and and then started taking business away from telcos and telcos had to act fast right and, and and basically digitally transform fast and figure out how to come back to that market and how to tap into that modern market, the digital market out there. And if you also remember, telcos were the holders of like some of the most, the largest data sets as well, right? Like they had call data, you had location data, billing data, buying pattern data, so much data. And then today that data is in like petabytes range, right? So, so Dialog's initiative was to basically look at all the services internally, all the proprietary services, figure out which can be exposed as APIs, and they exposed an internal developer portal, and that portal had more than 500 services exposed as APIs. Once that was done, they figured out that a certain subset of that can be exposed as external APIs to external marketplace, uh, to the external developers. So they exposed the external APIs, and then there was 30 or so at the time, which grew to a large number following that. And, but they didn't stop there. They, they went ahead and created this whole marketplace. And there were a lot of initiatives around uh, evangelizing these APIs, doing hackathons and workshops around building applications around these APIs. Uh, they also had a model where you, they had a venture capital program for anyone who was building uh, applications around APIs. Uh, and there were a lot of multinationals coming in and building uh, API uh, applications using like a, a operate a billing API or location-based service API or mass SMS API, so on and so forth. So it's a very successful story of a uh, sustainable marketplace that really worked. And it's not just the technology, it's the initiatives behind that that we'll talk about in this session and in the next session. So if you look at that example and tie it into this slide, right? so point number one is organizations have different forms of data and technology assets. Right? So if you take a telco, uh, there's a lot of data assets sitting within the telco. And as I mentioned, this can be call data, location data, movement data, billing data, so on and so forth. So in a typical telco, you'd have these assets. The telco will use these assets to provide better service within the telco organization. But that's really it. Right? But these assets are very valuable. This is, these are assets that the organization uh, captured and the organization collected and it grew over time right so this is really the value of a telco so these assets need to be built for use 
and for reuse, right? So if you expose them as an API, they'll be used by, let's say, one or two mobile applications. And if, when people start using those mobile applications, then you're really reusing that API, right? So one API is called, let's say, 1,000 times a day. You are reusing that API. And once you start reusing, if you, if you remember the original example that we gave about the four applications and the 10 users per application, you have a compound effect on that, right? So you have a technology return of investment, and that's a compound effect. So that really means that APIs are an encapsulation of intellectual property. Right? And, and that's a really good way of trying to understand your APIs. And that's a really, that's a really important concept for, for CXOs as well, to understand that APIs are really, really critical, especially if you're a telco or if you're a healthcare organization or if you're a bank, you need to be able to start seeing the big picture and figure out that APIs are now your new IP. Right? So you need to really start focusing around these APIs. All right, so principle number three, the value network, sorry, the value chain. Uh, so this is really, this focuses on Michael Porter's value chain as well. And the concept is that value increases as it flows through the digital supply chain, right? And let me take an example there, right? Let me take a, a healthcare example. So this, this applies to anywhere in the world, uh, in the US, UK as well. So you have the NHS and you have the different organizations. So this applies here as well. Right? So, so for example, in a healthcare network, you have a provider who, will, who are hospitals. Uh, you have the payers who are insurance companies. These payers can be government in some cases. Uh, they can be private payers. They can be individual payers, so, so the people themselves pay, or they can be the, the large or small insurance companies. And the objective of the provider is to make a happy patient, right? So, so basically, uh, a smiling face there. So you provide services to the patient, and you try to make the patient happy. And the payer also serves the patient. Right. So the payer pays the insurance premiums on the, the insurance claims on behalf of the payer. The payer pay, pays a premium to the, sorry, the patient pays a premium to the payer. Too many P's, sorry. And, uh, and, and the whole objective is to make the patient happy. Right? And there's a relationship between the provider and the payer. And within this ecosystem, there are other players as well. Right? There are the suppliers of the actual medicine, the drugs. They go through, in some cases, brokers who are called pharmacy benefit managers. And the pharmacy benefit managers set the price and they work with the insurance companies and the hospitals. In some cases, the suppliers work directly with the hospitals uh, and some cases with the insurance company as well. Uh, and then you also have different vendors who work with the hospitals, vendors who work with the insurance companies, so on and so forth. In some countries, this is quite simple, quite straightforward. In some countries, it's very streamlined. In some countries like the US, it's like mega, mega complex, right? So, but at the end of the day, bottom line is still the same. The objective is still the same, serve the customer. Um, and, and of course, so there are, so if you look at the value flown here, right? So the value of the flow of value here. Right? So for example, if you, if you take a vendor, if you take a, uh, electronic health record system, right? And, and one of the examples is one of our customers, like Cerner. Right? So electronic health record systems and patient information is stored, stored in the vendor database, right? And th that vendor database can then expose APIs in a specific format. Uh, there's a standard called the HL7 FIRE, the Fast Health of Interoperability Resources format, which allows you to expose these APIs to uh, insurance companies and hospitals, right? So, so you already get value there because now you're taking data that you're storing and you're exposing it to the hospitals, right? So at the same time, the pharmacy benefit managers has information about the, the drugs that are coming in, the manufacture date, the prices, the alternative drugs. If you take a specific uh, drug like paracetamol, there can be alternatives. So that information is also shared with the provider and the payer. So now the provider and the payer can then take those information, add on top of those in, on top of that information, and expose it to the patient as well. So value is now for, uh, flowing in all directions, and finally the patient gets a higher value uh, than basically directly interacting with one of the vendor databases. Right. So that's a clear way that value flows in a supply chain network, and that that's uh, that's the concept of a value chain as well. So if you take a supply chain like in this diagram and then you've seen this and you've seen this diagram 
uh, in previous sessions yesterday. Uh, so that's the typical supply chain. And, and we are mapping the API concept and the API platform concept into the supply chain. So this is the 21st century integrated supply chain for APIs. And if you look at the value picture, value also flows from, the, from layer to layer. Right? So for example, if you start with an integration layer, right? you integrate to backend systems, you integrate various systems, uh, you integrate the hospitals, you integrate the vendor systems, et cetera. And, and that's where you have your connectors, uh, your data connectors, so on and so forth. Right? Then you add value on top of that. If you take a single platform as well, you can add your insights, your monetization, uh, your observability, so on and so forth, your various capabilities. You then add value on top of that by creating your pipelines, by deploying multi-cloud, by coming up with like zero downtime deployments. And you add value on top of that by creating API products, versioning the APIs, market testing the APIs, monetizing the APIs, so on and so forth. Right? So the flow of value, if you, if you look at a network like the healthcare example, the flow of value flows from the lower levels of a supply chain to the higher levels of a supply chain. And if you take a single integrated API platform, it flows from the lower layers to the higher levels. And, and this, this diagram shows a similar example as well, right? So if you look at uh, this diagram, and I borrowed this from Asanka's presentation yesterday, uh, you have the systems of record, you have your data access and virtualization APIs, and you'll have APIs which have lower value or, or a value towards a certain set of consumers. And we call them utility APIs or, or any kind of services, right? So APIs that are consumed by a very small number of consumers or systems or, or other kinds of applications. Right? Then you focus on the higher layers, which are like services and logics, business processes, orchestration, et cetera. And we can call them domain APIs. And these APIs can be like business APIs or business unit APIs that encapsulate certain sets of utility APIs and services. And you expose those APIs to uh, the layer above, which can be the edge APIs. And these edge APIs can then be uh, consumed by end user applications, by your mobile applications, by your web applications, uh, so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, if you look at value, value is flowing all the way from the bottom to the top, and you keep adding value as you go up the ladder. Right? And, and that's an important concept when you talk about how APIs add value. All right, principle number four, and, and the last principle really, is, is basically value networks. So we spoke about individual APIs. We spoke about the chain of APIs or the value chain and how APIs act along a chain. But a very important concept and, and the basis of the next session as well is value networks, right? And this is a huge concept, especially in the last five to six years, right? Uh, if you look at examples like Uber and Lyft and Yabi and B and so on and so forth, the, the unicorn businesses that achieve like a million dollar, billion dollar valuation in the shortest period of time, all of these were platform business models, right? So, so that's an important uh, concept, right? So, so what we're saying here is API marketplaces and platforms lead to sustainable ecosystems. I've, I've created that in bold and network growth. Right? So that those are two key concepts. Sustainable ecosystems is very key. As I explained previously, there are failed use cases of platforms. So when you're creating a platform, when you're creating an API platform or business platform, it has to be a sustainable model. It has to be a model that is perpetual, that works on its own, uh, and then I'll explain what that means. It has to be a model that is consumed and used by different users, not just one core team. And then it has to contribute to growth, to network growth. Right? Uh, <clears throat> interesting diagram, if you've seen this before, uh, this is the famous uh, Uber business model. When, when Uber pitched its business model to uh, David Sachs, uh, and, and this was the diagram that was drawn during that uh, con conversation. And this, this is like the napkin diagram of uh, network effects. Uh, so if you tie this back to Uber, right? So if you, if you look at the top of it, so if there's more demand in the field, there'll be more drivers coming up, right, in the network. Uh, the, if there are more drivers, you have more coverage, more geographical coverage. So it'll be not just London, but in the outskirts as well. 
if there's more coverage, then that means you'll have faster pickups. So you don't have to wait for 30 minutes for, for a pickup. When there are more drivers, you'll, you'll get a pickup within five minutes, right? So, so when, when that happens, you, there is less downtime for drivers, which also means the competition is high and which also means the prices are low. So if you, if you look at Uber's model, you see the prices fluctuate right? often. So when it's high traffic, high network, high demand times, the prices go up. And, and so the reason why prices go up is so that more drivers come onto the field because of those higher prices, because you can earn more. Right? So then when there is less demand, you can uh, alternate this diagram, you can flip it on its head. And so when there's less demand, you have less drivers, so you have to lower the price, so you have to increase the prices so that more drivers have an incentive to come into the field and then they get into the field and that effect keeps improving. Right? So, so, but if how do you tie this into a platform business model? So if you look at the top, these are the consumers and it, it, it can be any type of a platform. This is the Uber example. This can be the Airbnb example for, for uh, rentals. Uh, this can be uh, any any kind of an example, like for example, food delivery, uh, or it can be an API platform where you have API consumers, right, or, or mobile application consumers, or an app store, so on and so forth, right. So you have consumers at the top. You basically have the uh, providers or the service providers at the bottom or wherever here. So here it's shown on the side here, and then you have the network effect of everything working together. Um, so you might have seen this diagram before. So this is the API marketplace diagram. And again, the diagram doesn't focus just on the technology side of things. So the technology is very important, right? So you have the developer portal, which forms the core of a marketplace. The developer portal allows you to list the APIs, subscribe to these APIs, test them, uh, read documentation about them, go into details about what are the resources about the APIs, so on and so forth, right? And, and then you have additional capabilities such as rate limiting them, uh, monetizing them, marketing those APIs, uh, tag, having tag clouds and social media forums, so on and so forth as well. Right? In, uh, in addition to this, you have the technology components shown on the right-hand side of this diagram, where you have the gateways, which are like the ubiquitous component that I spoke about. Security is key, so you need to focus on that. Governance is key as an overall concept, so you need to focus on governance and standards, and that ties into how you design and publish your APIs. Uh, and you need to look at analytics as well to see how your APIs are performing, right? So all of them, all of those are technology. If you look at the left-hand side of this diagram, um, you, you basically have the activities, which are very important in creating a sustainable marketplace, right? So you have the workshops, the hackathons, uh, the incentive programs, the evangelism activities, so on and so forth. Right? So, so basically, uh, you need to ensure that you enable and you empower application developers so that they build more innovative applications and empower internal service developers so that they create more APIs. Right? And this can be then consumed by uh, different consumers and by different producers. And if you look at the network effect of this, if you have more producers, right? So that means more products, more competition, more incentives for the actual consumers or buyers. And if you have more buyers, there's incentives for the, uh, cons uh, the produ producers of APIs. And again, I'm talking about API marketplaces here. This is relevant for business platforms and vice versa, right? So you have same side network effects and you have the cross side network effects as well. Very similar to the Uber network diagram that we spoke about. So bringing back to our example previously, uh, you have your value flowing between the chain, within the chain, and you then add this concept of a marketplace. So now you have an application marketplace where there are healthcare applications. There is an application marketplace where all these applications are listed. You have businesses coming and building different applications that compound the value. And then you, have, you create this concept of digital healthcare companies. And similar to the telco industry, you will have the over the year kind of concept. The, the providers who really don't have a, a health network, but who provide a higher value services and applications and digital value uh, around your APIs. And, and to do this, uh, so last few slides, to do this, you basically need 
a platform which supports an API centric architecture, right? Regardless of whether you want to go for a decent, uh, for a centralized architecture now, or whether you want to go for a decentralized architecture now, regardless of whether you want to go multi-cloud or whether you want to divide them into cells and have cell gateways at each level, the, the platform that you pick needs to support your API strategy, right? So it's, it's no good having an API strategy where, when your technology pick fails, right? So, so that's where basically a platform like WZ2 comes in, which provides you a flexible deployment model uh, to, for you to be able to basically implement your strategy. Again, a diagram I borrowed from yesterday, which shows a full view of the WSD platform, not just it broken up into API management, integration, and identity access management, but basically looking at the independent components. So if you're building a marketplace, you need the portal, you need the marketplace, you need connectors, you need the capability of rate limiting, you need and monetization. If you're building a full automated DevOps flow, you need the APIs, system APIs, you need the pipeline capability. You need to be able to deploy this in any cloud and, and have like managed cloud capabilities, so on and so forth. Right? So there are different aspects of technology that, that are required for different parts of your API strategy. All right, so, so that's, that's basically it. So uh, the key takeaways from this session, again, uh, is, is that you have to look at APIs as products. Right. And, and we've looked at that in yesterday's session as well, and we'll be focusing on that in today's session as well. But my point goes uh, beyond that. So what I'm saying here is it's not just the API. So you need to look at the value of the APIs, individual APIs. Then you need to look at the value of the API chain. What does that basically bring to you? And you then need to look at the value of the network as a whole, right? So the business platforms. And building successful API platforms, whether it's internal or external, is key to a very successful API strategy. Right? So key takeaways, APIs are not just technical. They are, in, they are encapsulations of your intellectual property. CXOs need to understand that. You need to focus on the value chain and the value network. But then you also need a platform, a technology platform that can support this. Right? And then that's where WC2 comes in. Uh, that's basically it. That's that's the gist of my session today. Uh, again, if you if you need to talk to me or if you need to talk to WSO2, uh, we have the contact details here. Uh, 